Former Fox News host Tucker Carlson could reportedly be in talks to interview Russian President Vladimir Putin. This is according to editor-in-chief of RT News, Margarita Simonian. Uh, she said during a talk show Sunday that Carlson is, quote, strongly requesting an interview with Vladimir Putin. It would be great if someone notifies the president about this. Now, during an episode of the Full Send podcast from this March, Tucker Carlson himself claimed that he was trying to interview Putin starting during the summer before the war in Ukraine began. Um, I'm not hiding anything, but I was definitely hiding my plan to go interview Putin just because it's an interview. So, no, so how no did that happen? Business. How, did, yeah. how do you know the NSA broke into your signal? Because they admitted it. Really? Oh, yeah. Like, can you tell us about that? Like, how did you find out? I got a call from somebody in Washington who's, who would know, just trust me, who, uh, so I, I went up there for another reason, but this person said, you know, are you going to come to Washington anytime soon? This was a year and a half ago, and I was like, yeah, actually, I'm going to be up in a week. Meet me Sunday morning. So weird. Like, who does that? Just text me. You know what I mean? Just yeah. text me. No. So I go, and this person's like, and this is someone who would know. Um, are you planning a trip to go see Putin? This was the summer before the war started. And I was like, how would you know that? I haven't told anybody. I mean, anybody. Not my brother, not my wife, nobody. And just because, you know, it's one of a million things you're working on. And, but that was one of them. I want to go interview. Why wouldn't I want to interview Putin? And here's some more from that interview. How would you know that? Because NSA pulled your text with this other person you were texting. How did you know that? And so I immediately, I was intimidated. I'm embarrassed to admit, but I was. I was completely freaked out by it. I called a U.S. senator who I know, not that well, but it seems like a trustworthy worthy person. And I told him the story. I said, I just want to tell you this. And then I went on TV on Monday and I'm like, this happened. And so they had, you know, in Congress asked NSA and NSA is like, yes, we did this. But for good reason, what would be a good reason to read my, you know, what? But the head of NSA, it's fine. It gets because everyone's in on it. Republicans and Democrats are all in on it. And by it, I mean the assumption there's no privacy whatsoever, that they have a right to know everything you're saying and thinking. I love to hear that bipartisan criticism of the deep state and an advocacy for a right to privacy. Yes, uh, the NSA's <laughs> routine spying and surveillance of American citizens is loathsome. Um, who was it, James Clapper, who lied about it in front of Congress? Obvious that he lied and he was never held accountable for that. Um, so that, yeah, that's this is kind of a side matter, but yeah, so it's interesting that you know Tucker explained that the NSA was looking at his messages. Um, prob I'm sure the news that he's trying to interview Putin, if he ever does actually interview Putin, you know, will be greeted with, um, look at this Putin puppet, look at this, you know, anti-American, how dare he, misinformation, et cetera, propaganda from uh, the usual suspects. Uh, of course, there's, you know, a long, you don't, it's not an endorsement necessarily of the person to interview them. Hey, we can, now we would, we'll, we'll critique the interview if we think it's yeah. um, too friendly as we recruit, uh, we critiqued his interview with, um, with, uh, with Tate, uh, sure. in particular is what I was thinking. Um, but it's not, it's not wrong to do that. Um, there's a, you know, a long history of, uh, of, of jur American journalists going to foreign countries to interview dictatorial type people. I remember when, uh, with the president of, Iran came to America, came to Columbia University mm -hmm. and was interviewed um, by Lee Bollinger. Um, uh, he was asked about, you know, his stance on human rights and LGBT rights. He said there's no gay people in Iran. The campus oh, thought yeah, that was pretty that. funny. Uh, so it's uh, it's totally fine to do these interviews. It, in fact, is the work of journalism. And we can critique it based on how it goes. But you're not some propagandist for considering the exercise. It's literally crazy that we, like, yeah. I'm, I'm like listening to you, like, why is this even a topic of yeah. conversation? Obviously, it's good to interview yeah. people. I'm sorry, I'm, the argument is what? Because Putin is so bad, you shouldn't do investigative journalism? So I'm sure the speculation here, given all the timing, is, is that, and we don't know, did his desire to do this interview, was it known to Fox, and did it play any role in the, is this an example of the kind of thing they did not want? We don't know. I, I think I saw some of that speculation. I, I'm even struggling with why would Fox object to an interview? Well, I don't know, and maybe he's they did Putin. Right. <laughs> right. He, he, he's the leader of an entire country. Right. A major world power. What 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 right. what argument against the journalistic merit of doing that interview could you possibly make? I have no idea. Now I I, I completely agree that 
there is a history of Tucker Carlson doing softball interviews that amount to not interviews, but kind of propaganda campaigns in favor of X, Y, or Z person. I think the Andrew Tate example is instructive. I think the most recent Donald Trump interview was a journalistically a journalism void. Um, mm -hmm. You learn nothing new. He let Donald Trump talk for 20 minutes about the Panama Canal, which was like vaguely entertaining. What? No, but not really we learned that Donald Trump actually thinks that Jeffrey Epstein did kill himself. Well, even that How was can you weird. Say that's not no, even that was weird because it felt like Tucker Carlson. I and mean, this is my subjective view, obviously. But he asked Donald Trump so many times if he thought that he was going to get killed. Yeah. That it almost felt like a weird sort of baiting. Like, I remember back in 2008 when Hillary Clinton was making the argument that she didn't want to drop out of the primary prematurely because uh, I forget which other candidate was killed. In, uh, in 2008? Yeah. What are you not? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that she, you know, so and so had been killed before, and so she should stay in just in case, like Barack Obama gets was murdered. Oh. And there was obviously oh, the so day much. Oh, she was trying to inject. Yes, the argument was there. she was exactly trying yeah. to put a mark on his back as the first yeah. black potential president, and he was getting he did get a disproportionate amount of um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, threats against him during his mm -hmm. time in office. So. Uh, that was what was in my mind, as, as Tucker Carlson kept saying again and again, but aren't you afraid they're going to kill you? Like, are they going to kill you? Are they going to kill you? Like, I was like, slow your roll, dude. I know, just, you just wanted to back off. It would be good content if uh, Trump said, yeah, they're trying to kill me, Tucker. They're animals. They're Wait, but, savages. But, but, he didn't, he no didn't say that. Like, it seemed, and no. this is all subjective, and I'm just reading between the lines, but it seemed like Donald Trump was also made uncomfortable by that line of questioning and kept skirting the question, which is why mm -hmm. um, Tucker Carlson kept asking him. So it was, again, entertaining, but in terms of uh, actual uh, journalism content, very low. So critiquing him after a Putin interview, if, in fact, he does not ask him incisive right questions, I think it's completely fair. Saying that the idea of interviewing a head of state is somehow what's seditious is in, insane, weird, cold war -y sort of um, uh, sort of a perspective. Now, in a new episode of his show, Carlson asked the prime minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, what he would do about the war in Ukraine if he were in charge of NATO. Let's watch. If you were in charge of NATO, if you were, say, Joe Biden, uh, what would your next move be in the war in Ukraine? What would you do? Peace immediately. Call back Trump. That's 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 the only way out. Call back Trump. Call back Trump. Because you know, you can criticize him for many reasons. I understand all the all the discussion, but you know, the best foreign policy of the recent several decades belonged to him. He did not initiate any new war. Yes. He treated nicely the, 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 the North Koreans and, and Russia, even the Chinese, you know. He, he, he delivered a policy which was the best one for Middle, for Middle East, Abraham Accords. Yes. So, so that was a very good foreign policy. He, you know, he's criticized that he's not, you know, he's not educated enough to understand the word. But this is not the case. Facts count. And his foreign policy was the best one for the world in the last several decades I have seen. And if he would have been the president at the moment of the Russian invasion started, no, it would, it, it would be not possible to do that by the Russians. So Trump is the man who can save the Western world and the, probably the human beings in, uh, in the globe as well. That's, that's my personal conviction. Yeah, in response to this clip, journalist Glenn Greenwald tweeted, I realize, of course, that both of the figures involved here are Hitlers, but I really encourage everyone to watch the first 15 minutes where the war in Ukraine is discussed. Whatever you think of Orban, uh, Hitler, in parentheses, he understands Russia and Ukraine for obvious reasons. This comes as Ukrainian drones struck targets in at least six regions within Russia yesterday, including an airfield where they destroyed military transport planes. Now, according to Reuters, the Russian foreign ministry said these attacks would not go unpunished and that the drones could not have reached so far into Russia, quote, without Western help, according to Reuters. Very so that, concerning. That's exactly the kind of escalation that reasonable, calm, level-headed minds mm -hmm. have been trying to avoid. Including, apparently, Viktor Orban's. <laughs> yes. And, in fact, I, there, was a, there was a piece in The New Yorker yesterday uh, called the case for negotiating with Russia that has a kind of regional expert who has been making this argument since before the war started that knowing that we weren't going to allow Ukraine into NATO, why not make public 
what was happening behind mm -hmm. closed doors. Why not take all of these off ramps that have presented themselves since the beginning of the invasion? And I do, am, I am heartened that there are mainstream that liberal places through. like The New Yorker who are making yes. these arguments. You know, whether or not you like Viktor Orban and think he's Hitler, sure. you don't have to listen to him to get the same kind of advice. It's all over the place. The question is, why is the Biden administration so stuck on this on when it's a political loser and yeah. a substantively bad idea? And defending, right, stuck on defending every inch of Ukrainian territory. Yeah. That's their perspective. Again, no one is saying Russia should be allowed to take over the whole country and that it should just become part of Russia. This is a dispute over certain territories that have significant Russian-speaking people and might want some DeSantis. kind of independence. A territorial dispute? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's, that's true, right? Yeah, it, it, it is true. And people want, like, nobody wants Russia to just steam over uh, Ukraine and kill everyone there. And that is so, uh, so avoiding that and, and all these thousands of thousands of people who have died in the course of this invasion, eventually we're going to have diplomacy. We can have it now, we could have had it yesterday, we can have it sometime in the future, but we're gonna have it. And we're gonna, there's gonna be an exchange of, they're gonna get something they want in exchange for, again, the entire country not being destroyed, yeah. which is worth avoiding. Again, if you, think, if you think it's so important to have World War III over this, again, over this ter inches of the country, then, I mean, more than inches on a map, more, obviously it's a significant amount of territory. But I mean, I, I'm not someone who thinks people have no right to self-determination or like a, a new nation or a new land can't change hands for nominally who's their sovereign. Also, it doesn't make any sense. Also, we don't view that. We don't believe that, right? We believe in self-determination. Europe, the maps of Europe have been redrawn 8,000 times the, in just the last 100 years. the question of self-determination is a complicated one because part of what preceded this whole conflict and preceded the Civil War was different world powers trying to exert their influence on Ukraine with the West and IMF offering one kind of an economic deal that comes with all of the austerity and the hardship on working class and poor people in a country that the IMF tends to impose versus a, a Russian package that I'm sure had its own pros and cons. There was a question, this was the whole deal with the Minsk Accords, right? There was a question of whether or not they should be allowed to vote to see which direction the country should go in. And the U.S. intervention in those elections with Victoria Newland and all of that that we've gone over right. so many times was to guarantee that the outcome was that there was going to be a leader that wanted to go the Western route. Um, and so that to, to talk about self-determination and not realize that there have been U.S. efforts at undermining the self-determination of the people of Ukraine, including those in the Western region, uh, sorry, and the Eastern regions that are Russian speaking and at least prior to this conf uh, conflict, right. if allowed to vote, likely would have chosen to have closer relationship with Russia, is really starting the story right. at a point which dictates an outcome that is not really uh, and honest, if the bulk of the country wants to be closer to a Western sphere, great, wonderful. But th that, and then some other part of the country doesn't. There's no, we we shouldn't. It, it's like uh, like Wilsonian or something to force people well, was, who have was, different the, interests the, the into the Accords same. The Minsk was going to accommodate some of yeah, that, give a certain a, amount of like uh, voting seats of the Western of the Eastern Bloc, yeah. and, and and the West didn't want that. They didn't want to have that entrenched like pro-Russian influence. They wanted to have the whole thing. Yeah. Now here we are. So here we are. More rising right after this.